good evening all welcome to isa online pg class greetings from isa national headquarters today we have got a very interesting class on a very important topic which we see in our day to day clinical practice of anesthesia that is patients who are post tci coming for non cardiac surgery and today we have got two very eminent teachers dr selva kumar p and dr evala r who shall be talking about anesthetic considerations for percutaneous coronary interventions in cath lab as well as these patients who are coming for non cardiac surgery so we welcome you all to the isa online pg class and i now request our coordinator dr nishant sai and dr parul jinder uh, to please take it forward dr nishant please thank you so much sir and uh, uh, today again we have our uh, uh, isa online pg class we have classes every monday uh, starting at uh, from 5 pm and uh, today sir is the 43rd class and it is uh, thanks to the isa leadership that uh, post graduates and young faculty members are uh, benefiting immensely from these classes uh sir all the audience will be muted uh, for the time that the class is going on and uh, just in case there are any questions that the audience might have during the class they are encouraged to type in the chat box just in case there are any questions by the speakers dr selva kumar sir or dr vadivelu sir then uh, they, the audience has also encouraged to answer in the chat box itself so uh, to introduce dr selva kumar uh, at request dr parul jindal now to please introduce dr uh, selva kumar sir and the speakers thank you dr nishant and uh, it's my proud privilege to welcome our speakers today thank you dr uh, good evening dr navin malhotra sir dr p selva kumar dr vedi velu and my dear students it is my privilege to welcome dr p selva kumar a renowned anesthesiologist and a teacher par excellence dr selva is a head of the department of anesthesia critical care and critical care and department of emergency medicine at velamal speciality hospital madurai he completed his md from kmc mangalore in 1997 from 1997 to 2000 he was in the cardiac anesthesia department at apollo hospital chennai from 2000 onwards till 2015 sir was a senior consultant in cardiac anesthesia department of apollo hospital madurai he has served iisa in various capacities as a past president of iisa tamil nadu as a past treasurer of iisa tamil nadu He was also past secretary of ISA Madurai and past vice president ISA Madurai. Sir was a past executive council member of ICTA, and he has five publications, national and international journals. May I request Sir to take over the stage and enlighten the students and audience alike with his lecture on anesthetic considerations for PCI in cath labs and post PCI patients for non cardiac surgery, and also introduce our second guest speaker, Dr. Vedi Velu, a cardiologist of immense repute from the Madurai. uh thank you dr sir and sir please take over uh, thank you dr navin sir thanks for this opportunity and uh, my chat persons uh good evening to each and every faculty member and post graduates who are attending this meeting and it is proud and privileged to be here and this fine evening uh, i heard this is for 43rd meeting it's really great and amazing to conduct continuously every monday Uh, for on, as online classes uh, so let us move on to the topic uh, anesthesia considerations in cath lab what are all the normal procedures that can happen in cath lab and also what are the role of anesthesiologist in cath lab so once again uh, role of anesthesiologist the presence of anesthesiologist may be necessary during various cardiac catheterization procedures for monitored anesthesia care sedation analgesia or general anesthesia and also for resuscitation of patients when complications arise during the procedure as access to the patient is very difficult due to the fluoroscopic equipment and once again this is not going to be slide working 
So one second. Ah, yeah. Access to the patient is difficult due to fluoroscope equipment all around the patient, and the lights will be dimmed like a movie theater, and the tables will be moving all around. All three sixty degree, they'll be moving the tables. Patients are mostly far away during the procedure, and we are not accessible. And we need a long monitoring lines, long breathing circuits, long intravenous tubings, including the intraoral carbon dioxide. If it's all required, if it is a patient going for general anesthesia, anesthesiologist must be assured easy access to the patient, in particularly to the airway. Interaction between the cardiologist and anesthesi anesthesiologist is very very important. Drug induction, intubation during induction and intubation, one must ensure that cath lab technician moves the fluoroscope away from the patient so the airway can be secured by anesthesiologist when we are when necessary to intubate in between the procedures. Should always try to minimize the effects of anesthesia because all these drugs uh, have effect on cardiovascular system, and you know these patients are always at cardiac unstable. Oxygenation and ventilatory management should be done according to the diagnostic procedure. as it also can influence the diagnosis particularly in pediatric cath procedures most of the pediatric cases coming for diagnostic procedures they will be having lot of various shunts so when you have a oxygen administration your uh, shunt will not have a correct results and this results are very important for surgical correction too so if you give oxygen and the results varies your surgical correction will have a impact on that and need to be well aware of access point and related complications in your lab your gas a gas outlet anesthesia machine available medications like next to you and all the drugs ready for intubation and resuscitation should be prepared and kept ready what are the normal procedures we do in cath lab now uh, of late in 2022 almost all procedures have been done in the interventional way like uh, 15 years or 20 years back when we started cardiac uh, anesthesia the, it is situation is totally opposite very rarely we have been called for cath lab procedures because except for regular coronary angiogram all the patients will be subjected for surgery and very rarely they do high risk angioplasties especially triple vessel disease or any left main disease or the vessels which is which are not very easily plastiable all these cases will come to operating room but now the situation is totally opposite almost 90% of the cases can be done in cath lab by our interventional cardiologist they have been experienced in managing all variety of high risk cases so percutaneous interventions like regular angiogram plasty it uh, we called in for cath lab so for sedation and if any complications arise during the procedures especially for hemodynamic instability we have to manage the airway and the cardiovascular system percutaneous closure of asd this is a well known procedure and is happy for quite some time and the latest technologies we can have te on table for proper correction and further management transcatheter cardiac valve stents all the general anesthesia is commonly used the non invasive post pressure ventilation and deep sedation also been tried very successfully for valve cases and cath study balanced anesthesia with control ventilation is uh, advisable for any cath study electrophysical physiological studies have taken up a great way now almost every city has got a electrophysiologist who does all variety of uh, uh, ablation therapy and correction for atrial fibrillation and all the rhythm uh, 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 disturbances can be corrected in the lab which was not happening previously previously we used to use only pharmacological agent to correct all the rhythm disturbances most procedures under moderate sedation if suppose cardioversion is needed you need deep sedation with the help of opioids and barbiturates which can be used very safely even in uh, wolf parkinson white syndrome now the latest advancement is our dexedrine and etomidate it they also can interfere with your electrophysical studies so it has to be shown to suppress the svt after congenital heart surgery or during electrophysiological study so high frequency jet ventilation can be used for af ablation to reduce any chest movement uh, during the procedure and also it can be used with left vein atrial volume changes the intravenous anesthesia is used for this technique and now you know that apart from the cardiologist most of the radiologists are doing interventional radiology program and they do stenting in almost all the vessels in the body uh, next one is our tra trans arterial thrombo uh, chemoembolization is been done by our oncologist and biliary stenting is done by gastroenterologist see now how many departments are using this cath lab it's not only one by cardiologist which was happening the previous days now interventional radiologist uh, our gastroenterologist 
and almost all the department has got some kind of work in cat lab and when there is a workload increasing in cat lab we should be very happy that even anesthesiologist workloads are also increasing and we can also have one extra avenue other than uh, our regular like cardiac neuro obstetric pediatric pain medicine you know, intensive care we can have a sub speciality like anesthesiologist for cath lab in near future this is going to happen in, in next few years maybe within 2 3 years it can happen and i know one center they have the separate dedicated anesthesiologist and cath lab right now next one is vascular access by cardiologist if the cardiologist wants to approach through the neck then you should have a proper air management and fao2 is a important concern and all other procedures like diagnostic and invasive procedures have been done if invasive there is always a possibility of vessel rupture and uncontrolled bleeding or sudden crash so we should have a volume expanders and suppose the patient is going to be very high risk old age anemic with the group grouped and typed in available in cath lab next one is if neck approach is used there's possibility of hemo and hemothorax too not only bleeding it can also have a hemothorax so whenever we do any neck procedures if the patient these such rates or the patient is not able to manage the ventilation please suspect pneumothorax and they have a fluoroscope uh, next to you so you can just verify and if necessary as anesthesiologists were very familiar with putting a needle for pneumothorax always which all the wires and catheters have been inserted into coronaries and all heart chambers any heart block or any kind of arrhythmias should be anticipated by anesthesiologists at any point of time coil embolization for pda it happens regularly in almost all cath labs and patients have been done in less than 10 years we do under sedation and balloon dilatation alone can use be useful in certain high risk cases where full of calcium but the patient is very sick you cannot put a stent and the stent will not hold good then your balloon angioplasty is a uh, choice in that case the balloon can rupture and we should be very careful in that situation and thrombosis or any dissection of any coronary arteries are very very common during coronary angiogram i have seen lot of cases of air embolism during plain coronary angiogram patient coming for diagnosis at diagnosis coronary angiogram the patients can have air embolism now the latest technology is transcatheter aortic valve implantation that is so called tavi this is an alternative but less invasive method for high risk patients compared with surgical aortic valve replacement tavi may cause serious complications including hemodynamic instability requiring inotropic support embolization of heart aortic material uh, it can cause aortic regurgitation after tavi or it can cause complete heart block requiring a permanent pacemaker or vascular access damage and hemorrhage can occur or, or the metal frame stent may be placed incorrectly so all so many complications are there in tavi but it but it's taking a big way now the people are uh, very familiar and very convenient doing tavi in most of the centers in tamil nadu what i know is the tavi is uh, just one or two hours procedure in cath lab and it avoids a major surgical procedure especially in elderly patient with aortic stenosis with lot of comorbidities and this patient can walk home on third day which will not be possible in a open heart surgery a co coordinated multidisciplinary approach including cardiologist surgeon anesthesiologist perfusionist and cath lab technicians nurses all of them are to be in a single line and we need a cautious anesthetic management which is very very essential for success of tavi without the team approach this tavi is not going to be a successful one so role of anesthetist good pre operative risk evaluation for tavi is needed and we should identify the risk factors such as previous interventional procedures signs of any failure or all laboratory investigations the retrograde transfemoral approach is most commonly used because this is the comfortable technique for the cardiologist and role of anesthetist is very important for successful outcome because elderly patients often have multiple comorbidities and organ dysfunction as already mentioned inadequate hemodynamic management during tavi procedures very very common which can lead to increased mortality and morbidity in the post operative period so the optimal hemodynamic stability should be maintained throughout the procedure by the anesthesiologist so you can go either for general anesthesia or local or conscious sedation with local anesthesia depending upon the patient condition so in most of the centers they do under local anesthesia with conscious sedation and few centers still they practice under general anesthesia so the look use of local anesthesia is very in recent years outcomes are very good and no matter what technology used but the anesthetist must provide 
a very good optimal hemodynamic stability during the procedure. And if at all you plan for local anesthesia with uh, conscious sedation, the anesthetist must be ready to perform full GA at any point of time. So always keep all the drugs loaded and endotracheal tube uh, next to you just to convert this uh, procedure into a general anesthesia. In summary, communication and planning in consultation with cardiology department and all your colleagues, you facilitate the patient care in remote location like at need to be an alert during the procedure as you will not have a routine help or you will not have a routine anesthesia machine or facilities available like operating room and you should be aware of a progress of every stage of the patient like what stage they are doing now in theater we, we are not very particular like what stage the surgeon is right now because monitoring is same and facilities are there you have technicians trained nurses and the environment is very familiar to you because day in and out you do the procedures in our operating room, which is not so common in outside procedures. Be prepared with crash card for all the procedures, even though you take a small case, for example, on ASD closure for sedation, but you should be prepared to manage the situation. So with this, I thank uh, everyone. Now I request uh, our cardiologist, very eminent cardiologist, uh, Dr. Vadi Velu, to talk about Regular cath lab procedures are very complex cases, what we did so far. And finally, if time permits, I'll tell you how a post PTCA patient coming for non cardiac surgery should be handled. Now, over to Dr. Vadivelu. Any doubts uh, you do you have in this topic, you can clarify now. Over to the chairpersons. Thank you, sir. And uh... Just in case there are any doubts by any of the uh, audience members, uh, they can chat, uh, type in the chat box itself. Currently, they are all muted, sir. Uh, once the talk is over, uh, we can take all the questions one by one. Uh, whatever doubts or queries they might have uh, regarding uh, the talk for today, we'll take at the end of the uh, session. Uh, over to you, uh, Vadivelu, sir. Uh, thank you, sir. Am I audible, sir? Yes, yes, you are audible. Thank you. But your slides are not yet uh, visible. Not visible? No. Is it visible now, sir? Not yet. Uh, I think you'll have to stop sharing and then again go back and uh, yeah, yeah. try. Yeah, Yes, the full screen now. Yeah, perfect. Thank you. Okay. So, uh, sir, I have a uh, like, lot of questions in between. So, how do the audience will respond or let, let us... Uh... Yes, sir. So, once the uh, multiple choice questions or whatever questions you have, when, whenever they come, okay. uh, I, I'll read it out to the audience and the audience will be encouraged to type the answers in the chat box. And then uh, we can discuss uh, the question and the answers with you. Okay. So a very good evening to one and all, and I thank uh, the Indian Society of Anesthesiologists to provide me a very wonderful opportunity, and I'm delighted to present in this uh, uh, elite forum. So as Sarah has outlined uh, many of the interventional cardiac procedures, my aim is to touch upon uh, the basics of ECG knowledge of acute coronary syndrome. Why? Because many times. Uh, the role of anesthetist becomes uh, unavoidable because uh, many times the ER is manned by anesthetist team. Uh, during PCI, we have anesthetists and the post-operative critical care is also manned by anesthetic, anesthetist team. So uh, I would like to say anesthetists should know uh, the ECG basics of acute MI in detail as, as detailed knowledge by a cardiologist because the patient care can be improved dramatically uh, by improving the ECG knowledge. So today, as many PGs are involved, I will touch upon the basics of common garden variety of acute MIs. And I will also uh, touch upon the basic complications during PCA and after PCA, how to monitor all those things. So this is the case-based uh, case lecture. 
So first one, we start with the MCQ or interactive session. The 52-year-old male, diabetic and hypertensive, is presented with severe chest pain since 2.30 a.m. He has, uh, has come to our hospital, he has reached our hospital at 5.30 a.m. Echo showed EF of 45 percent with mild hypokinesia of uh, inferior wall. So uh, this is the ECG. I hope the ECG is, uh, the ECG quality is good and it is, uh, uh, the visibility is also good. Yes, yes, the ECG appears fine. Uh, we are able to see the ECG. Okay. So uh, I would like to ask, what is the diagnosis in this patient? What is the probable or possible culprit vessel in this patient? And what is the treatment of choice? Suppose provided the patient has come to a hospital which has the cath lab facility. And what should the anesthetist expect? Uh, expect the anesthesia implications, I mean. So if, if somebody can say what is the diagnosis and what is the culprit vessel, then it is... Uh... Yeah, so the audience is encouraged to just uh, type what is the diagnosis. Dr. Chandrapriya believes it is the inferior wall infarct. That is the response that has come. Okay, inferior wall infarction. Okay. So anybody can guess which vessel so there are only two vessels that can produce an infarct. Voice is voice is a little uh, breaking. Uh, yeah. Can you come a little closer to the mic, sir? Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Yeah. So, so uh, yeah, the culprit vessel now. The culprit vessel. So, it, the inferior wall infarction is usually caused by complete occlusion of either right coronary artery or left circumflex artery. So, can we have any... Uh, yes, Dr. Chandrapriya has answered right coronary artery. And, uh, yeah, Dr. Rita Dadwal also believes it is the right coronary artery. So, uh, very good. The answer is right. So, it is right coronary artery occlusion. Yes. And I will just go through the ECG in depth. So, uh, so here the ECG shows ST elevation in lead 2, lead 3, and you can see in AVF, right? Here, the height of ST segment elevation in lead 3 is greater than the height of ST segment elevation in lead 2. And you can see there is also ST segment depression in AVL. So, if you have this phenomenon, like the height of ST segment elevation in lead 3 greater than lead 2 and ST segment depression in AVL is there, then it is right coronary artery occlusion producing acute ST elevation inferior wall MI. One more thing is, it is not only isolated inferior wall MI, it is also an associated posterior wall MI. Why do, you, why do I say that? Because we are here we can see V1, V2, they show good amount of ST segment depression. So it is acute infro posterior wall MI caused by complete occlusion of right coronary artery. The additional point is here, the first degree AV block is also there because here the PR interval is somewhere around 240 milliseconds. So any inferior wall MI associated with any AV block is always due to right coronary artery occlusion. Now, the second question is, what is the treatment of choice? So we know that in patients with any acute coronary syndrome, especially ST elevation, myocardial infarction, either we have to thrombolize or we have to take up the patient for primary PCI. So if the patient has reached a cath lab enabled center, then the treatment of choice is definitely primary PCI because we have trials uh, stating that primary PCI has got mortality advantage over thrombolysis. This is very well proven in multiple trials, randomized control trials, as well as in meta-analysis. What suppose if the patient has landed in a peripheral center where there is no chances or no options of cath lab facility is there, then it is better to thrombolyze the patient and immediately ship the patient to <coughs> cath lab enabled center. Uh, what if the center is very close? Suppose if, if there is a peripheral center, but it is close to a cath lab center, then it is ideal to load the patient with aspirin, clopidogrel, and maybe give a shot of heparin and refer the patient straight away for primary PCA. The, the, the cutoff point is if a patient can be referred within 120 minutes of arriving in a peripheral center, then it is better to load and refer the patient. If you think the patient will take more than 120 minutes to reach a cath lab enabled center, then it is better to thrombolize and refer the patient. This is very, very important because uh, we know now, um, even in peripheral centers, sometimes uh, the anesthesia team integrates closely with the ER team and sometimes the ER team entirely is manned by anesthesia team. So it is better the anesthetist should know uh, when to refer, when to lice or when to lice and immediately refer the patient. So this is a simple chart showing uh, how the ECG will look like in the right coronary artery occlusion, which I have told already told you. Whereas in left circumflex coronary artery, 
the height of st segment elevation in lead 2 will be greater than the height of st segment elevation in lead 3 and 1 and avl will not show dramatic st segment depression they will be isoelectric or they may even show slight st segment elevation so it's a very important and uh, somebody they say they call even call it as dead man sign so what is dead man sign dead man sign is you see here avl and avf if you see avf is showing a very high st segment elevation and avl is showing st segment uh, depression this combination of both these things is called st segment depression they it's like a this is a dead man with two eyes here and it is lying these are the two limbs so you can uh, you can just uh, imagine horizontally lying this is a dead man sign so dead man sign is indicative of inferior wall extensive inferior wall ma due to rca occlusion so this is what i have been uh, telling you one shortcut is if any patient with inferior wall infarction is presenting with any degree of atrioventricular block like first degree second degree or third degree av block then straight away it is rca occlusion because lcx occlusion will uh, most commonly will not produce any av block so this is that patient angiogram we know that our heart has three major vessels first is the left main coronary artery which divides into left anterior descending artery and here this is the left circumflex coronary artery left anterior descending artery supplies the anterior portion of the heart this is the cranial view which shows the lad here left circumflex supplies the lateral aspect of the left ventricle and the posterior wall of the left ventricle here the lad is showing uh, uh, lesions of 70% stenosis here this is the culprit vessel you can see here the rca is completely occluded proximal rca this is the right coronary artery which is a she she shaped vessel vessel which is 100% occluded our anesthetic team trained by dr selu kumar sir they are there they 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 know to read the angiogram and they just just by looking the angiogram they will say rca is completely occluded 100% occluded a 100% occlusion is always a dire emergency and you we should open up the vessel as fast as possible i will just go through the very uh, gross steps of angioplasty because uh, the anesthetist should know at which step the patient can develop uh, complications there will be specific complications that can occur during a, each and every step of angioplasty this is after uh, cannulating the vessel with the guide this is the wiring of the we can see a wire a radiopaque marker a thin wire is there that is placed across the lesion and after balloon angio plain balloon angioplasty you can see there is a critical 95% lesion in the proximal rc once the vessel is open sometimes patient can go in for reperfusion arrhythmias in the form of atrioventricular rhythm or ventricular tachycardia sometimes patient may even develop ventricular fibrillation sometimes patient may develop complete heart block or high degree of av block so we should be watchful we should not be happy that the vessel is open patient is going to be fine sometimes opening the vessel may produce uh, uh, consequences adverse consequences so we should be uh, vigilant and watchful so after this is the balloon angioplasty and this is the stenting deployed and this is the post dilatation and during post dilatation again during stenting and post dilatation there can be happening what are, uh, the phenomenon is called no flow or slow flow what is no flow phenomenon once you open up the vessel with the plain, plain balloon angioplasty once you implant a stent or once you post dilate the already established flow in the coronary become reduced like we call timi 3 flow which is a normal flow it may become a timi 0 that is slow flow or that is no flow or a timi 1 or timi 2 which is a slow flow so once the vessel is open and once it the slow slow flow sets in or no flow sets in patient will become dramatically sick so many times we see stented patient stented patient uh, the ecg settles down but after post dilatation patient becomes sick again they go they may develop pulmonary edema they may de develop a reinfarction all the patient may even need an intubation at that point of time so we have to be very very vigilant so until the patient is shifted to cath lab uh, out of cath lab to the icu uh, the whole team comprising cardiologist and anesthetist should be very very uh, careful it is not just implanting a stent patient will be all right no it's not like that slow flow can set in even after post dilatation as well you can see the beautiful resolution of st segment elevation after stenting 2 3 avf the st segment has come down dramatically t wave inversion has started so when do you say we yeah, just glance a very uh, gross criteria to say uh, successful pca has been uh, done to the patient is that patient symptoms should come down uh, patient pulmonary edema should come down if if the patient was in pulmonary edema he will feel better chest pain will be dramatically reduced ecg will show at least 50% reduction in chest segment elevation uh, in most of the times it will be more than 70% and two waves will start appearing and there will be two wave inversions will be there a t wave appearance of t wave inversion is associated with reduction in st segment elevation is a sign of open vessel which means that reperfusion has started happening so what is the anesthesia application before pci 
it is very vital in this patient to monitor vitals because the first thing you need to know which was present in this patient yes. may may convert into a advanced form of the vital the patient had so brady induced ventricular tachycardia or brady induced ventricular fibrillation torsades patient may get arrested so this patient should be uh, carefully monitored for heart rate blood pressure saturation respiratory rate and hemodynamic instability has to be oper- uh, has to be monitored very intensely and mechanical complications has to be assessed before pci during pci and after pci it's very important because mechanical complications can set in at any point of time so the most important mechanical complications can be picked up clinically in the form of auscultating if you auscultate and if you pick up a soft murmur in the apex then it is due to acute severe mr or if you pick up a, a pan systolic murmur in the parasternal region it is ventricular septal rupture so these are the two common uh, mechanical complications which makes the patient unstable and the prognosis become very bad and i'm going to give you what analysis to give what analysis not to give because you know there are been studies which have shown that both morphine and fentanyl and every analysis that has been used they interact with clopidogrel and they reduce the antiplatelet efficacy of antiplatelet agents especially clopidogrel with uh, with the ticagrel or also morphine and propofol uh, as well as fentanyl they tend to uh, reduce the antiplatelet efficacy so we have to be very careful and we should assess when to intubate the patient because if patient is shifted to catheter in an unstable position in, in an unstable uh, situation uh, with pulmonary edema then it may be very difficult and messy to get the patient intubated in the catheter table because we know there is no space for anyone there Uh, the boys apparatus may be congested and too many people will be there and everything so it is better to explain to the patient attendants and intubate at the ER and see the patient so that they can be placed and we have time for time for doing the procedure so these are the five important things uh, which should be monitored by everyone involved in the care of acute and patients heart rate blood pressure respiratory rate and saturation acid for murmurs and acid for pulse Doctor Vadi, I'm sorry to disturb you. Your voice is actually, you know, uh, breaking off in between. Uh, the voice quality is changing. Uh, if you could just speak close to the microphone. Uh, yeah, thank you. Okay. Uh, the heart rate. We all know heart rate is a simple thing that can be monitored uh, inside the hospital. We know heart rate more than 100 and MI patient is not good. And studies have shown that any heart rate that is more than 80 beats per minute. is not good and clearly heart rate more than 80 beats per minute is associated with increased mortality so if two patients are coming to us one patient has an heart rate of less than 80 beats per minute if the second patient has heart rate of more than 80 beats per minute the second patient who has a high heart rate is associated with increased mortality also extreme bradycardia is also not good on coming to cardiogenic shock this is the most important thing and i want to just spend some time on this slide we know that the one month mortality or 30 day mortality of acute mi st elevation mi patient is somewhere around 4 to 5 percentage without cardiogenic shock but if an acute mi patient presents with a cardiogenic shock then the one month mortality or the, even the in hospital mortality is very high it is as high as 60 to 70 percentage so so if you can just compare 5 percentage 4 to 5 percentage mortality without cardiogenic shock and 60 to 70 percent mortality with cardiogenic shock so if the blood pressure is less than or equal to 90 at presentation systolic blood pressure then this patient has to be pursued very seriously things have to be pushed because we know getting a cath lab activated and getting things done in indian hospitals wherever even in corp prime prime corporates is sometimes difficult especially in the odd hours so if somebody sees a bp of 130 he can be he can slightly be reluctant or slightly take some time but if we see a bp of 80 then he should push and he should uh, do things aggressively uh, rather than being complacent so these are the four uh, five stages of shock stage a is at risk so the patient is not having hypotension but he will go into hypotension if not treated properly so for this matter all acute mi patients are stage a i will say they are they are at stage a so if uh, coming to stage b it's the beginning of cardiogenic shock so patient has hypotension tachycardia but there is no hypoperfusion patient will not have cold clammy extremities there will be no aliguria there will be no mental uh, confusion 
Stage C is it's set in hypoperfusion as certain, but the patient is not deteriorated to a uh, de deteriorated beyond a certain level. The patient has signs of hypoperfusion, like cold, clammy extremities, alleguria, the mental confusion or mental abundation, all those things. Stage D is an end stage, or uh, I'll say deteriorating. There is hyperperfusion with deterioration, but the patient has not gone into refractory shock. And stage E is extremis, that is an extreme form of refractory shock. Where you can see here, the mortality uh, uh, differs from 5 to 70 percentage. If the patient comes in stage E, then the mortality is more than 70 percentage. You can see very clearly. And you can see this is an IAVP shock to risk score, which is available online. So you can see uh, taking the uh, age, history of other things, hyperglycemia, renal function, and arterial lactate. So any sick patient or patient with hypotension, it is better to take an ABG at, at the outset. And if the lactate levels are higher, this is one of the important predictors of uh, increased mortality. So in a, any arterial lactate more than 5 millimoles per liter is, is associated with increased mortality. We all look at bicarbonate, but it is also important look, to look at a lactate. So this is very important. You can see here the mortality rate. If the score is 5, 5 to 9, then the mortality is very high. It is somewhere between 60 to 80 percent. Whereas the score is less, then the mortality is less than 5 percentage. So it's very important to look at all those things. And uh, before the thought was, if a patient with cardiogenic shock with MI come in, we previously, these patients were neglected. Even the trials have excluded all these patients because they were considered very high risk. They were they were given only medical management. They were neglected. But now they have been aggressively pursued and they have been taken in, built into cath lab as fast as possible. And the emergency uh, revascularization has been done. And uh, we know mechanical support devices like IABP, Impella, and ECMO have been aggressively being. They have been uh, added to the armamentarium of uh, cardiac and as well as anesthetist team. Again, this mechanical circulatory devices is one area where the interaction between cardiologist, cardiac surgeon, and the anesthetist become very crucial because only if these three people along with the other support staff, they, 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 the coordination is correct and the patient comes out. It's not just opening the vessel with the stent will make the patient survive. It is the coordinated team effort uh, along with the PCI, the circulatory support is very important and, and the post-operative care is also very, very important. The post-procedural care is also very, very important. So this is what uh, this I have already explained. Please ascultate for some murmur so that you can pick up some of the mechanical complications because sometimes in an urgency, this has been missed by the attending physician at the ER. So once the patient comes to the table and once the anesthetist comes inside because the cardiologist may be busy in catheterizing the patient, uh, once the anesthetist picks up for mama, say, and this has happened in our lab, the, the, uh, because sometimes the mechanical examination may, may have onset during the transfer of the patient and, uh, and our anesthetists are many times picked up. So the patient has soft systolic moment the apex. I think the patient has an acute severe MR. And our anesthetists, they are good in doing an echocardiogram as well uh, because we all know transesophageal echo has now been shifted from cardiologist to anesthetists, especially during peri uh, CTVS operative procedures. Uh, from the experience gained in the transesophageal echocardiogram procedures, uh, they have also gained uh, experience in trans thoracic echocardiogram as well. With our, our anesthetists, they will do an echocardiogram and they will pick up uh, LV dysfunction, pericardial effusion, uh, suspected free wall ruptures, metal regurgitation, BSR, all those things. It is not bad to learn those things because if you if, if somebody can pick up those things and can help the cardiologist, then the patient's management becomes better. So uh, going to the other patient, this is a 50-year-old male, severe chest pain, two hours. Again, ECG showing ST elevation lead to three AVF, ST segment depression, AVL. So, and here the difference is the V1, V2 anterior leads is showing ST segment elevation. Again, this is an inferior wall infarction, but again here, this is an inferior wall infarction associated with right ventricular infarction. Why I'm saying that what are the signs of right ventricular infarction is if V1, V2 shows uh, ST segment elevation or V1 alone shows ST segment elevation, then is a sign of right ventricular infarction. So you can see here, this is a catheterization angiogram. This is a right coronary artery. Here it's occluded at the proximal level. This is after thromboception. You can see a lot of clots. The worm like structure here is nothing but clots. And this is after successful angioplasty. You know, the RCA is occluded even before the origin of right ventricular RV branch here. So once you open up and establish this RV, you can see the side small vessel is RV branch which supplies the right ventricle. So this patient presented with acute inferior wall infarction with RV infarction because sometimes patient presenting with RV infarction, it will be very difficult. They will go into refractory hypotension 
So these patients are extremely preload sensitive and IV fluids have to be aggressively used along with inotropes and other uh, agents. So this is another patient. This is one of the common diagnoses even missed by cardiologists sometime in, in, in a busy uh, practice. What is this patient? This patient is having severe chest pain since two hours. So what is the diagnosis? Can we have answers in the chat, chat box? Yes, yeah, so, so the, the audience, here. yeah, they can take a look at the ECG and uh, whatever uh, they feel, they can just type in the chat box. Uh, does anybody have any diagnosis to this? The options are given A, B, C, D, sir. Yeah. So is it inferior uh, posterior wall MI with RC occlusion, inferior posterior wall MI, LCS occlusion, AWMI, left anterior descending occlusion, or the PWMI, the LCX occlusion? Uh, Dr. Attam Singh believes it is uh, D for Delhi. Yeah, yeah and absolutely Kandra, he, he Kandra is spot on. Yeah, yeah, congratulations. Yes, congratulations, yeah. yes. So whenever there is a good ST segment depression in anterior leads, especially V1, V2 or V1, V2, V3, then we have to suspect posterior wall MI. So isolated posterior wall MI is rare. Usually it happens in the presence of inferior wall MI, but posterior wall MI, isolated posterior wall MI can happen. And in a very large uh, volume cath lab centers, it is not uncommon to see in isolated posterior wall MI, like two to three cases in a month where we do around some uh, 500 cases per month. It's not um, what I'm trying to say is this is this has been this will be treated as non-ST elevation MI and patient will not be lysed or patient will not be taken up for primary PCA. This is one of the common mistakes. What I'm trying to say, whenever there is a good ST segment depression in V1 to V3, we should always take V7, V8, V9 because our routinely placed leads from V1 to V6 will not record the posterior wall of the left ventricle and we needed an extended uh, recording from V7 to V9, which picks up the posterior wall electrical activity of the heart and ends to pick up the posterior wall MI. Even if it is here, we can see there is not a dramatic ST segment elevation. Even if it is more than 0.5 mm ST segment elevation in posterior wall, then it is taken as posterior wall MI. And we all know isolated posterior wall MI occlusion occurs in the setting of LCX occlusion. Here you can see very classically, here this is the here, this is the left main, this is the LAD, this is the L6, and this is the uh, mid L6, which has to continuous as LPDA, is occluded here. And after successful angioplasty, you can see this is the mid L6, continuing as distal L6 and continuing as the distal LPDA. This is the posterior wall of the heart. So once this is infarcted, once this is occluded, it has resulted in posterior wall MI. And after successful recanalization, the patient's symptoms improved, ECG changes have improved. So posterior wall MI should not be misdiagnosed as non-ST elevation MI because only giving heparin and antiplatelets will, will not do justice for this patient. Please take V7 to V9 and please advise whoever is going to attend this patient, sir, this looks like a suspected posterior wall MI. Should we go ahead with V7 to V9? It is always a good practice to take in, in the setting of inferior OLMA to take right side leads in the form of V4R, V5R, V6R, and in the setting of suspected posterior OLMA to take V7, V8, V9. And this is another patient, this is again an MCQ question, 45-year-old male with chest pain, eight hours. Uh, what is the diagnosis? We have four options. Yes, sir. Uh, everybody can take a look at the ECG and uh, they're encouraged to answer whether it is uh, a inferior posterior OLMI, RC occlusion, Inferior posterior wall MI LCX occlusion, anterior wall MI LED occlusion, or posterior wall MI LCX occlusion. Uh, the audience are encouraged to type their answers in the chat box. Uh, yeah. There is no harm actually if you if you uh, type whatever you feel. It is just for engagement. And so once you are engaged, then you will explore two options. It is either between A and B. Okay. Yes, sir. So. Uh, uh, there was first first response why was by uh, some person with the vivo y 21a and uh, most of them have answered b for bombay dr praveen dr neha dr anu they have they believe it is uh, b for bombay yeah, absolutely they are right sir uh, you, you, the, your team is uh, good they are good <laughs> yeah yes. it's absolutely the answer is info acute info postural infarction second to l6 occlusion why is here we can see the st segment elevation in lead 2 lead 3 avf is there and here, but the ST segment elevation in lead 2 is greater than lead 3. And you can see 1 in AVL is not showing any great ST segment depression. And you can see the V1, V2, V3 is showing ST segment depression. So it is inferior wall MI plus posterior wall MI and it is caused by L6 occlusion. 
So this is the patient. I will play the videogram. You can see this is the LCX and it is uploaded here. And this is after stenting. You can see after this is stent mesh like structure is there. This is after stenting. So this is before stenting. It is uploaded here and after stenting, you can see the vessel is flowing fully. So very and the most important anesthesia consideration or uh, uh, the most important thing is when we are doing PTCA in the LCX, especially in acute thrombotic setup. Sometimes when we are pulling the stents, when we are pulling the balloons out, there can be a thrombus shift in a retrograde direction from LCX to left main or from LCX to LAD, and patient can become suddenly sick because the left main can get occluded. Patient can develop a fresh anterior infarction. Patient can develop VTVF. Patient can even go for cardiac arrest. So uh, we may think that the patient is having L6 occlusion, but during procedure, the thrombus can shift because it is the left main bifurcating into LAD in L6. It can also happen in LAD intervention also. During an LAD intervention in anterior MA, thrombus can shift into L6 and patient can develop an inferior wall or a posterior wall infarction and patient can succumb secondary to these complications and patient can throw up a new arrhythmias. So we should be very careful. And uh, this is again, uh, this is a middle-aged male with back pain relieved by burp since last three years. He doesn't give any history of chest pain. He says only back pain that is relieved, relieved by burping. But that is this is happening again and again. It is not getting relieved by antacids since last three hours. So which is false regarding this ECG? Which is false regarding this ECG? A, the tombstone pattern. B, extensive inferior wall MI. C, uh, this has a guarded prognosis or... Uh, D, either lies or do primary PCI ASAP as soon as possible. What, what is false? What is uh, not true about this condition? So the audiences are encouraged to answer whatever they feel. And uh, yes, Dr. Atam Singh believes it is uh, extensive uh, inferior wall MI. Dr. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yes, sir. It is good. Uh, yeah, the answer is the, the actually it is an extensive anterior wall MI because we see ST segment elevation in V1 to V6. So it is anterior wall infarction. So what are the other dangerous signs here? We can see the QRS, they are like tombstone. You know, what we know tombstone uh, pattern. It is like a rectangle. The ST segment elevation is frightening. It's alarming. It is a uh, rectangle shaped ST segment elevation, what is called tombstone pattern. And the QRS, they are wider. The, the QRS is not narrow. The QRS is wider QRS. And you can see there are reciprocal ST segment depression in 1, 2, AVR and everywhere. And also there is ST segment elevation in AVR. In the setting of acute myocardial infarction, if AVR shows ST segment elevation, that itself is a sign of very, very poor prognosis, right? And if there is a tombstone pattern along with ST segment elevation in AVR, and if there is a corresponding ST segment depression in 2, 3 AVF, and if the QRS complexes are wide, that means this patient has got an extensive infarction, he is going to die any minute, and patient has patient attendance has to be told a guarded prognosis, and this patient has to be either lysed or should, should be taken for primary PCA as soon as possible. So you can see the angiogram. This is the left main, and this is the LAD is completely occluded here. And here, this is the LCX that is flowing. And one more view. This left main and this is an osteal LED occlusion. Osteal LED occlusion is, is equivalent to left main disease, and this patient has to be treated very aggressively and fastly. And this is after angioplasty. You can see a vessel has been created here by stenting. And this is a cranial view shows so this patient uh, improved dramatically and has been uh, discharged. You can see here this is the pre -angio, uh, angioplasty. Uh, ECG, which shows tombstone, white QRS, C segment elevation, all those things. After, you can see the QRS become narrower. They become more beautiful. The ST segment elevation has come down dramatically and T wave inversion have started appearing. Here, you can see there are no T wave inversions. So, reduction of ST segment elevation with the appearance of T wave inversion is a sign of successful uh, recanalization or reperfusion of the vessel. Right? And, and, and the reciprocal ST segment depression, they have also gone down. You can see the AVR. The AVR is no more showing ST segment elevation. These are the good signs. These are the ECG signs of successful <coughs> recanalization. Another case, 52-year-old male with chest pain for eight hours and went to a local hospital. ECG showing ST segment elevation anterior leads. Diagnosed as acute as ST elevation anterior wall MA. Now, the cath lab is available at a distance of 100 kilometers from this place. Then what should be done now for this patient? 
so these are the four options either thrombolyze in the peripheral hospital and refer for angio or angio versus pci pre hospital thrombolysis during transfer to a pci hospital or refer for primary pci immediately d is just anticoagulant and stabilize And Dr. Chandra Priya and Dr. Atam Singh believe that uh, it should be A, thrombolyze in peripheral hospital and refer for angio and PCI. Yeah, Dr. Alam also believes that. Uh, so yes, sir, it's correct. So that, since the hospital is located distance of hundred kilometers, the patient should not be referred directly for primary PCI, and already he has wasted somewhere around. Uh, eight hours. He is delayed presenter. There's a lot of debate that is going on. Somebody can even say, "No, already has wasted time. So why not you?" Uh, because in abroad countries where they can airlift the patient, they usually do this uh, primary. But in Indian setting where you cannot uh, do airlifting, all those things, it is better to thrombolyze the patient in the periplasma and refer immediately for angiogram followed by uh, rescue PCI or facilitated uh, or our uh, pharmacoinvasive PCI. What is pharmacoinvasive PCI? You lyse the patient and send the patient and take the patient for angiogram after three hours of thrombolysis. That is called pharmacoinvasive PCI, which has been very well validated in Indian settings. There have been a lot of trials from Indian uh, patients as well. Pre-hospital thrombolysis is not done in Indian settings routinely. What is pre-hospital thrombolysis? Is the cath lab ambulance staff? They are adequately trained. They will they will go to the patient's house. They will take the ECG there. They will electronically transmit the ECG to the cardiology uh, cardiologist. And cardiologist will see and say, okay, this patient has ST elevation MI. You lyse the patient during transfer on the ambulance itself. But somehow this system has not picked up in India. So it is the option is better option is option A. And this patient, you can see the angiogram again. The LED, you can see the LED is the, the superior branch that is occluded. You can see here no vessel downstream. And this is after angioplasty. You can see this vessel has come down. This vessel has been created. So uh, the treatment modality varies for each and every patient, and it has to be coordinated along all the uh, care uh, caregivers. And this is again one one other one other patient, fifty year old male presenting with uh, chest pain since two hours. Trope is borderline elevated. Sometimes patient may present with a chest pain. The trope may be normal. It doesn't rule out acute coronary syndrome because trope will show starting elevation only after six hours. Okay, so whenever you have an acute left bundle branch block rhythm, then in the patient, the setting of acute coronary syndrome, any patient with left bundle branch block pattern that is in the form of QS, white QRS with QS in V1 and positive. Uh, QRS in V5, V5, V6, then it is suggestive of acute coronary syndrome, equivalent of antiviral MI or antiviral MI equivalent. There are a lot of named criteria, but for uh, for uh, plain understanding, if there is symptoms suggestive of acute coronary syndrome along with acute left bundle branch block pattern in ECG, then this patient should be aggressively pursued. You, you can see here this patient has got distal left main occlusion. There is no vessel here. The distal left main is completely occluded and the occlusion, the L, there is no flow in the left main, there is no flow in the LAD, there is no flow in the L6. This is after <clears throat> successful left main to LAD and left main to L6 angioplasty. If the ECG is not picked, then sometimes it may be missed and patient may die during transfer or even after reaching the emergency. So for nutshell, if there is ST segment elevation in one AVL V5, V6, then it is called lateral wall MI. If there is ST segment elevation in two, three AVF, that is an inferior wall MI. If there is ST segment elevation in V1 to V3 or V1 to V4, it is called anterior wall MI. If isolated ST segment depression in V1 to V4, then it is posterior wall infarction. So AVR should always be looked at. If AVR shows ST segment elevation in any patient with acute coronary syndrome, then it is associated with severe disease, triple vessel disease, left main occlusion, or osteoproximality occlusion, and it is associated with worse prognosis. This is one more sign, 51-year-old male with a vague chest pain, drop is negative. So will you consider this ECG as benign or, or is, is, this ECG, is this ECG normal or abnormal? Or I will put this way, is this cardiac chest pain or non-cardiac chest pain after looking at this ECG? Any answers? Cardiac yeah. chest pain or non-cardiac so chest pain? What could this mean? Is it a cardiac chest pain or a non-cardiac chest pain? That, that is the question, sir. Yeah. So Dr. Atam Singh believes it is cardiac and uh, we encourage uh, other audience also. They've been interacting quite uh, well, actually. Uh, there have been quite a lot of responses. Uh, what could this be? Uh, this, is it cardiac or non-cardiac? So the, the few people who have responded believe it is cardiac, sir. Uh, okay. Dr. Rita, Dr. Alam, 
Dr. Atam, they all believe it is it could be cardiac. Dr. Chandrapriya also. Yeah, very good, sir. The answer is cardiac only. Sometimes patient may present with vague chest pain because the interpretation and uh, of chest pain by the patient himself and its comprehension and its communication to the cardiologist itself is a cumbersome process. Sometimes they will say it is only a problem of gas, ultimately turning to be a disaster. So though the patients complain of vague chest pain, though initial prop may be negative because in initial hours of uh, MI, it can be negative. But the ECG sometimes or in many times, it will give us some clue. Here, what is called a deep T wave inversion in V1 to V3 or in this patient, even up to V4, it's always we should suggest, we should think of what is called Wellen syndrome. So this, you can see this proximal LED is a critical stenosis, 90 to 95 percent stenosis here. And after this is angioplasty. So what I'm, uh, what I'm trying to say is, there is a syndrome called Wellen syndrome where patients may present with vague symptoms or patient may present with typical angina. But this is, this is a pre-infarction state in which if you do not diagnose the state, this is not a dramatic state. There will be subtle uh, biphasic T inversion in many patients. In some patients, there will be deep T wave inversion, but there will be no ST segment elevation. But if you miss this diagnosis and send the patient from the emergency saying that it's okay, patient will definitely return to you in one week with massive ST elevation and wall infarction. So this is one of the pre-runner or precursor of massive anterior wall infarction. There are two types. Type B is biphasic. What is biphasic? There's the T waves goes up and comes down. Positive, negative. That is biphasic. B for biphasic. A is uh, type A valent is very rare where you can see a deep symmetrical rocket shaped T wave inversions in anterior leads. And there is one more sign called D winter sign where you have J point depression, ST segment depression. And there is an upsloping ST segment depression that is more than 1 mm with a rocket like or a peak symmetrical T waves that is suggestive of D winter sign. This is uh, this has been uh, described in 2008 by D winters. Again, it is a, a sign of acute proximal LED occlusion where you can have anterior wall MA. So in a nutshell, what are the anesthesia considerations during PCI? During PCI, we all uh, we, we know that careful monitoring of vitals, especially any drop in heart rate or any appearance of new arrhythmias or any, any new onset cardiogenic shock. Patient may be stable before, but during procedure, he may become sick. He may develop a new cardiogenic shock. Those are very important. Patient should be continuously monitored for pulmonary edema on oxygen status. And any cardiogenic shock, these are the things that should run in mind, like ischemia, thrombus migration, stunning of the myocardium, no reflow or slow flow phenomena, metabolic acidosis, especially lactic acidosis, and any new onset mechanical complication should always strike the mind. Arrhythmias, very important uh, because our anesthetists, they are very good in picking up the arrhythmias. Any, any VT first time, sometimes they will pick up VT before 100 and they'll just give xylocot, they'll give amidoron. If needed, they will shock the patient. Uh, VF should not be missed. Complete heart block, idioventricular rhythm. Many times when you open up the vessel, patient will show a stable idioventricular rhythm that should not be misdiagnosed as ventricular tachycardia and patient should not be shocked. And sinus tachycardia is the most common rhythm during acute MI and sometimes patient may rarely develop atrial fibrillation during MI uh, PCA procedures. And bleeding has to be monitored. Impending respiratory or cardiac arrest has to be uh, anticipated and, and treated before. And many patients with MI with uh, depressed LV function may not tolerate neuromuscular block blockades like vecuronium, propofol. If, if, if possible, these agents should be reduced. The dose should be reduced. But in dire situations where you can, you have to intubate the patient, this has to be given and carefully um, the patient should be monitored and treated. And pulmonary edema, as I've told, the causes being ischemia, LV dysfunction, mitral regurgitation, contrast overload, new onset mechanical complication, especially ventricular septal rupture and mitral regurgitation and cardiorenal syndrome. These are the common causes for pulmonary edema during PCA, also after PCA yeah. also. Because when a patient comes to the critical care unit post-PCA, these should be uh, monitored and these should be understood because sometimes the residual ischemia may be there. Sometimes patient may develop stent thrombosis. Stent thrombosis may present as pulmonary edema or arrhythmias. Treatment, we all know that oxygen, NIV, and needed intubation, diuretics and vasodilators have to be given. And acute onset heart failure and acute MI, there is <coughs> levosimendon is one agent where we can uh, use and explore. And a restoration of blood flow is very important. And intracoronary agents like sodium nitroprusside, uh, nitroglycerin, nicorandel, diltiasm, uh, verapamil, adrenaline, these are the agents that are proven to improve the slow flow and mechanical support devices, which we commonly use is intra aortic balloon pump is the most commonly used in sophisticated settings. We can even go for ECMO or we can go for Impella. 
So uh, cardiogenic shock is the most important nightmare and I've already told the causes and is ischemia has to be addressed in the form of revascularization. Mechanical complications like VSR, uh, papillary muscle rupture, free wall rupture, urgent surgical consult and uh, surgical repair has to be uh, pursued yeah. on high risk and uh, cardiac, cardiac, mechanical cardiac support devices has to be used. Myocardial stunning, IABP, ECMO, no reflow. These are the pharmacological agents. Metabolic acidosis have to be corrected, thrombus migration, adequate antiplatelet preloading, reparinization, thrombus aspiration and IV antiplatelets have to be considered. And coming to this, the one of the most important thing. So again, one more question. This is an old anti volume post PCA to LED. Injection fraction is very low, 25%. Patient presenting with palpitation with diaphoresis with postural dizziness. So what is the diagnosis in this patient? So this is a wide QRS tachycardia that is going on. In a patient with already established scar in the heart and a low EF, poor LV function. So is it SVT with aberrancy? Is it monomorphic ventricular tachycardia? Is it polymorphic ventricular tachycardia? Is it antidromic tachycardia? Uh, the responses are polymorphic uh, and monomorphic between the two, monomorphic and polymorphic uh, ventricular tachycardia. Uh, okay. the, uh, the, most of them believe it is uh, monomorphic. Yeah, very good. Rita uh, Dadwal, Dr. Rattam, yes, Tanya. Yeah. We believe it is monomorphic. The answer is uh, monomorphic ventricular tachycardia. So the clue lies in the question itself, and the ECG is very clear, suggestive of monomorphic. What is monomorphic? Is if it is, you can see the lead to it is positive throughout. Suppose if in the lead to rhythm strip, if there is a positive QRS and they're going for a negative QRS, if it is oscillating between positive and negative QRS complexes, switching the baseline, twisting the baseline, then it is polymorphic PT here. It is a monomorphic PT. In a patient with an old myocardial infarction with a scar in the left ventricle and a depressed LV function, he usually develops monomorphic PT because this is because of the re-entry phenomena that is running between the normal myocardium and the scar myocardium. So this is monomorphic ventral tachycardia. This has to be recognized in the ER. Sometimes a patient uh, post PCI, sometimes this can develop even after 42 days of MI. This patient may come and land up uh, in the anesthetist hands in the uh, critical care or in the ICU where we should recognize, we should not miss this. This is one of the common diagnoses uh, that is encountered and it should not be missed by anyone because once you see this and if BP is normal, then you can go for amiodarone if BP is not normal, if the patient is hypotensive or patient is an acute pulmonary edema, then we should immediately shock the patient. So very easy. Once if you don't do this, then patient may succumb. So very important. So so there are two types of ventricular tachycardia that can occur in the setting of MI. One is during acute MI period that is called ischemic BT. Ischemic BT is usually polymorphic ventricular tachycardia. I will show the ECG later. But scar BT occurs usually more than 42 days after MI. That is predominantly monomorphic BT. Treatment here for polymorphic BT is urgent reperfusion in the form of PCA or thrombolysis. The other agents like intravenous uh, xylocot, magnesium sulfate, amidoron can be tried. And cervical sympathetic denervation, again, this is one domain where anesthetists play a crucial role because in two of our patients where we have exhausted all of our pharmacological drugs, like in the form of xylocot, maxel, pamidoron, but patient continued to show, uh, continued to throw ventricular arrhythmias by, by simple procedure, which I'll show later, the, the ventricular storm, the VT storm has come down and patient remained arrhythmia free in the short term. Okay, uh, which is more dangerous, both ventricular tachycardia is more dangerous, but out of the two, polymorphic PT is very, very dangerous because if you don't treat it, patient will degenerate into ventricular fibrillation and it will immediately result in death. Okay, the treatment is, uh, do treat, the, just not, you, if you shock, the patient will not improve. If you shock, the, it will go off, but it will again come back. It's like a bouncing, it's like a ferocious tiger, you have to treat the associated conditions and you have to open the vessel as fast as possible. Whereas scar VT is relatively uh, a, a benign one. If you shock the patient, it will not come back, at least in most of the patients. So antiarrhythmic in the form of amiodarone, mexilitin, phenytoin and beta blocks have to be tried. And cervical sympathetic denervation also play a role even in scar VT also. And this can be done even percutaneously or it can be done uh, through VATS, video-assisted thoracoscopic surgery as well. And A6, there is implantable cardioverter defibrillator. This is one of the procedures done to reduce sudden cardiac death due to ventricular tachycardia. And this is, uh, I would like to uh, thank my mentor, Dr. Yash Lokanwala in Mumbai, who is one of the pioneers in India to study the effect of 
uh, cardiac sympathetic denervation in patients with icd storm or vt storm what is storm recurrent ventricular tachycardia more than 3 vt episodes within 24 hours period so in such patients once you have depleted all the treatment like icds anti arrhythmic agents all those things you have ex exhausted still the patient is having recurrent uh, vt episodes then you can do a video assisted thoracoscopic resection of cervical thoracic ganglia like in the form of lower stellate ganglia plus t2 t3 t4 if you resect thoracic ganglia c7 c8 then the patients will do there have been data until uh, up to 3 years data majority of the patients do not have vt storm their their vt burden comes down significantly in acute setting in acute ma patient who is th throwing up a recurrent ventricular tachycardia this is one of the procedures that can be done by anesthetist where you just palpate the carotid artery and at the lower border of preferred cartilage just medial to the uh, carotid artery you can go give a posteriorly uh, you can go posteriorly and you can uh, hit upon this vertebra and you can in infiltrate the local agents like either xylocaine or bupivacaine or a mixture of two so you can do it under fluoroscopy guided you can do it under uh, ultrasound guided as well so this is one of the very good effective bedside procedure that can be utilized to save the patient's life and in in, in fact we have saved two patients life uh, by doing such a simple procedure after doing pca after giving all the agents right so this is again one more important anesthesia elevation uh, anesthesia consideration during pca and after pca and this is the polymorphic vt ecg you can see here the vt you can see <coughs> here it is positive the amplitude is higher it has become isoelectric and the amplitude is here it is switching the baseline you can see here again so this is polymorphic the morphology is keeps on changing and this is again you can see here st segment elevation is here in the slate and again this patient is developing uh, ventricular tachycardia this is polymorphic ventricular tachycardia again this should be recognized and patient should be immediately treated and i have already told all the causes for shock associated with acute mi rv infarction is one of the causes and uh, these are the complications of myocardial infarctions one is free wall rupture pseudo aneurysm formation bsr papillary muscle rupture rv infarction and thrombus complication these are some of the uh, why because in the post operative uh, critical care sometimes anesthetists may uh, train themselves and recognize patterns of uh, this is partial free wall rupture where you can see some pericardial effusion is this is lv this is rv this is pericardial effusion and you can see some echodense material is there and there will be some dyskinesia so if you see this things the pericardial effusion a dyskinesia in the segment and if you see some echodense then you can uh, you can say a thrombus coming and trying to obliterate that free wall uh, rupture sometimes this thrombus will save the patient once this gives way through and through then it is a full free wall rupture partial free wall rupture is a rupture starts but the thrombus comes and saves the patient it occludes it's what we see here this thrombus here echodense thrombus this is a partial free wall rupture a full free wall rupture patient will not survive partial free wall rupture patient may survive and echocardiography it can be picked up and it can be suspected and ct will confirm the diagnosis again ventricular septal rupture is not uncommon the incidence is somewhere around 0 0.5 0.2 0.1 to 0.5 percentage and you can see this is the left ventricle this is the right ventricle this is interventricular septum there is a rent seen here and you will see a mosaic jet in the color doppler and it can be very easily picked up clinically there will be a pansystolic murmur will be there in the parasternal region this is a very important cartoon that shows uh, this is the right ventricle this is the left ventricle this is interventricular septum this is the anterior aspect of the left ventricle and this is the posterior aspect of the heart and you can have ventricular septal rupture anywhere you can have it in the anterior aspect you can have it in the mid aspect you can have it in the posterior aspect you can have it in the inferior aspect anywhere so it's a very important thing and again you can see here this is a ventricular septal rupture and uh, sometimes patient may be taken up for cabg in acute ma setting patient may be having triple vessel leptin disease and if you see something a cord like structure hanging down the mitral valve is not coapting properly or if it is coapting and some structure is coming above the plane of coaption then you have to suspect of you have to suspect partial or a complete partial uh, papillary muscle rupture which can result in acute severe mitral regurgitation usually this results in an eccentric mitral regurgitation what is eccentric it goes along this either anteriorly or posteriorly it will be directed and you can see very classically and this is the cartoon showing uh, a ruptured papillary uh, muscle which is infarcted right this is a pseudo aneurysm you can see here this is a late complication after myocardial infarction ct will ct or cardiac mri will show pick up this pseudo aneurysm and uh, last few slides and what is the echo picture revealing in this case of this is a case of acute myocardial infarction uh, what is this echo picture is showing 
Yes. So what is the eco picture revealing in a case of acute MI? Is it uh, inferior wall MI, anterior wall MI, RV MI or the posterior wall MI? Inferior wall MI, anterior wall MI, right ventricular MI and posterior wall MI. Eco picture. Are there any responses? Yeah, I mean, uh, you're all encouraged and uh, right or wrong, Dr. Priyadarshan uh, feels it is inferior wall. Dr. Attam believes it is uh, RVMI. Sir, RVMI is correct. Uh, RVMI. So whenever, yeah, whenever this is a very important, just doing a four chamber echocardiographic view is very important in the post-op setting uh, because this is, we can see this is the, and so here, uh, this is the LV, this is the right ventricle, this is the LA, this is LV, this is metal valve, this is RA, RV, and this is the tricuspid valve. Normally, the RV should be as equal sized as LV or sometimes it will be smaller than the LV. So whenever we see a larger right ventricle than a left ventricle, then it is always pathological. The common differential diagnosis being right ventricular infarction or RV strain secondary to pulmonary thromboembolism or secondary to pulmonary arterial hypertension, other differential diagnosis being car pulmonary. So in the case of acute MI setting, it is always a right ventricle infarction associated with inferior wall MI showing a dilated right ventricle, dyskinetic right ventricle with RV dysfunction. So whenever you see this, then it is never normal. The patient has an associated RV MI. So uh, in, in, in view of uh, time consideration, I will skip these slides. So what is the importance of RV infarction is that because only giving ionotropes without IV fluids is not going to solve the issue because we know that LV is both dependent on preload and afterload, whereas RV is predominantly dependent on, on preload. That if in RV infarction, the preload is dramatically reduces and it is extremely preload sensitive. So if you give a lot of IV fluids, and along with inotropes, the hypotension improves dramatically rather than giving only uh, inotropes, right? If you give only inotropes without eye fluids, it is worsening the condition because tachycardia sets in and patient will go for a spiral of cardiogenic shock and, and uh, hypoperfusion. So how will you diagnose associated RV infarction? By echocardiogram, you can easily diagnose. And in the ECG also, if there is ST segment elevation in V1 or V2 or ST segment elevation in V1, Associated with ST segment depression in V2, this is extremely highly specific for RV infarction. You can clinch the diagnosis of RV infarction and you can treat the patient uh, accordingly. And obviously, the confirmation comes from the right side elites. If V4R shows an ST segment elevation of more than or equal to 0.5 mm, then it is RV infarction is confirmed. So, isolated RV infarction is extremely, extremely rare. It usually occurs in the setting of acute inferior infarction and, and, and secondary to RCA occlusion. So post PCI, again, vitals monitoring, new hemodynamic worsening, any bleeding, because bleeding is going to be associated with nightmare, both for the cardiologist and anesthetist, because many drugs we cannot give. And especially if it's a local site, then we have to look for hematoma, local site hematoma, retroperitoneal hemorrhage, and sometimes the bleeding may be obscure. We had one uh, uh, elderly gentleman who hemoglobin dropped. We were searching everywhere, everywhere, but couldn't find. Ultimately, that patient was taken up for DSA. We found to have uh, colic. Some of the branches of the colic artery uh, was bleeding because it was a case of uh, diverticulosis, and we have done an angioplasty. And because of the antiplatelet agents and this thing, he had a colic artery bleeding, and we have to do a gel foam embolization and his bleeding up improved. So in many patients where the, the source could not be localized, CT abdomen, urgent CT abdomen is mandatory. And arrhythmia is very important. We should recognize all the arrhythmias and we have to treat accordingly. When to extubate the patient is a million dollar question. I completely hand over the answer to our uh, anesthetist team and uh, Dr. Selakumar sir is very experienced and, and I completely give my patient, surrender my patient after PCA to him because he has saved so many, many patients of mine and other, our colleagues. And because his time of extubation is never, we can never debate with him. He, is, he smoothly extubate the patients. And, and central line insertion is very, very important in a cardiac patient, unlike in non-cardiac patients, where cardiac patients will be in a lot of antithrombotics, anticoagulants, antiplatelets, a single arterial puncture may take the patient of life. We might have done a wonderful PCA procedure, the patient will come out, but a wrong prick, a single prick and a single sheath insertion would kill the patient. Uh, again, the role of anesthetist in this um, area is very, very crucial. And when to shift the patient to ward, again, this is very important and, and this has to be taken in consideration with the, uh, our anesthetist colleagues.
so with this i will uh, end the session this is just a cartoon to show how congested this is during a pacemaker procedure you can see this is the boil apparatus here is the uh, assisting nurse here is the cardiologist uh, here is the anesthetist team this is very congested and you, it's not like ot where you have where you are the king and do where in 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 the cath lab the space is constrained and you, you can see here again you can see here uh, because this cath lab table this fluoro radiation table comes as a great hindrance and we can never do procedure without this and anesthetists have to struggle a lot uh, especially if the patient has to be intubated in an emergency patient because sometimes patient will be getting intubated simultaneously and we will be deploying the stent simultaneously or we will be doing some procedure simultaneously so with this i end my talk and any questions and doubts we can uh, discuss yes uh thank you so much uh, dr vadivelu and uh, uh, it was a really nice and comprehensive lecture uh, replete with all the uh, images and the ecgs and i'm sure uh, it will be useful not for uh, for a lot of post graduates because in many centers uh, in even in government colleges uh, many centers do not have these uh, uh, cath labs also so uh, this was a very very useful lecture for uh, i'm sure all of them uh, dr selva sir Yes, yes. Uh, are we planning on a session, uh, or should we take the questions now, sir? Uh, as you as you wish. Yeah, we can take up questions. Already six twenty. Yes. We can take up and discuss uh, important points because we have a cardiologist and uh, cardiac anesthetist are there. Right, sir. So, Doctor Parul. Uh, yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah. Uh, well, do we have questions? Yeah. So we have two questions. One question is from Doctor Praveen Kumar. He's asking Doctor Selva. What is the ideal choice of airway if the patient collapses during cath procedure? As interruption of uh, CPR takes place for tube placement, is placing IGL till CPR continues a viable option? Yeah, when the CPR continues, it's better to intubate the patient immediately. We can, whenever there is any arrest or any uh, catastrophe, we'll uh, we'll request the cardiologist to so move move the CPR, and we'll leave, we'll ask them to leave the airway space free for us for a minute or two. when the cpr team continues cpr we'll in initially ventilate with oxygen and then subsequently we have to intubate and then pass to the circuit then otherwise we cannot continue the procedure uh, beyond that you cannot stand near the patient for long time only they will give uh, that initial 2 minutes time for the cpr intubation so that we will intubate uh, simultaneously with cpr and proceed for further procedures by the cardiologist Uh, so your voice is not very clear could you speak closer to the mic yeah yeah so, once again now i'm audible yes sir it's audible now sir what about yes. the igl do you think that supraglottic airway is a better option to put rather than intubate the patient at that time uh, supraglottic airway it's useful but we don't know what condition we are landed up in this case suppose if it is an acute mi if the patient is with full stomach or we don't know whether the patient has been prepared already and second thing igl placement may not be always uh, be secured as you know pulmonary edema will be very severe when there is a severe pulmonary edema it's very difficult to ventilate without a proper control ventilation by the circuit or a, a boils machine so all these things has to be considered you know i think that answers the question dr praveen kumar can we take the second question is by dr chandra priya uh, sir she asks you whether Which uh, sedative agents will you prefer during angioplasty? What is your opinion about midazolam and fentanyl? Yeah, my first choice is always uh, midazolam of uh, minimum dose one mg to one or two mg, followed by fentanyl incremental doses one microgram per kg. And if suppose the patient is quite comfortable, it's fine. Some patients still they'll not be comfortable during acute angioplasty, like acute MI. Then that situation we use uh, etomidine. It's very cardio stable. We are, uh, no more. We are using thiopentone. That is out of this thing. Either propofol or etomidate. Etomidate is more cardio stable than propofol, and uh, it be titrated uh, as per the patient need. We have to monitor the hemodynamic stability as well as we have to put the patient to sleep. If you put the patient more to deep sleep, again airway is the problem. You are away from the airway. So we have to balance to keep the patient sedated as well as hemodynamic stability and avoid airway instrument. And so, so what about doses? Hmm. I'm so sorry. So, what about dexmedetomidine? Would you like to use dexmedetomidine uh, at this point? Yeah, we have tried in few cases, but uh, there is lot of hemodynamic instability. Right. We have seen hypotension, 
already this patient is uh, have, uh, having the blood pressure of 70 80 many a times around a mean of 40 to 50 this dexmedetomidine again can go and reduce in that situation even avoid medicine we directly give a small dose of fentanyl for pain relief and analysis and also we go for it to meditate to keep them quiet dexedina uh, even post op icu management we are avoiding nowadays okay. it causes significant hypotension in the post op patient uh Dr. Vedavila, there's a question for you by Dr. Hethvi K. She's asking you how to differentiate between MI and wrongly placed leads. It's very easy because uh, if you place the leads wrongly, there will be no ST second elevation. No? The only thing is uh, there will be confusion in uh, identifying the vessel. Which vessel? Culprit vessel identification may become uh, very tricky. But uh, wrongly placed leads will not show ST second elevation per se. Right, the AVR may be positive, AVL may be negative, uh, but it will not show ST segment elevation. Only the, the the direction of QRS complex vector will be different, but there will not be ST segment elevation. But if you have placed leads differently, limb lead misplacement in a patient with acute MI, then you can completely misdiagnose. Sometimes the inferior wall MI may be uh, misdiagnosed as you know lateral wall MI or anything like anterior wall MI can be misdiagnosed as inferior wall MI. Uh, so, angiogram will give you the clue. Anyhow, any ST segment elevation along with chest pain and enzyme elevation, you are going to place the patient. So, majority of the times it won't happen. But if you uh, uh, if you just see the ECG, there are some patterns where you can pick up. If, uh, because limb lead replacement itself is a big topic. So, it's very easy that uh, we can pick up and uh, treat the patient. Correct. Thank you, sir. I think that answers your question, Dr. Hethvi. And uh, Dr. Nishant, we don't have any further questions from the audience. Right. I can uh, take over. Dr. Parnul, I think what we can do is we can allow all the audience members to unmute themselves. And just in case they have any questions or queries, they might ask themselves. And not just questions or queries, if they have their... Uh, Nishant, now everybody is unmuted, so they can ask the questions. And you can also unmute, and the teachers can also unmute themselves. Uh, right, sir. So, uh, if any member in the audience has any uh, comments to make or any uh, questions or queries uh, to ask. So, yeah, I see one hand raised, yes. uh, sir. Uh, could you just unmute yourself and just uh, speak on the mic? Number, uh, there is a number, 2603479911. Sir, meanwhile, can we take the other question by Dr. Chandrapriya? Oh, yeah, sure. Dr. Chandrapriya has asked a question. She says, there's a 30-year-old man with 50 hours of ST elevation and inferior lead. So what is, will we do for pre-op evaluation? Dr. Selva. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. 30-year-old young fellow with 50 hours of ST elevation, uh, I think 99% uh, of this patient will have got thrombolized. Now this patient is posted for elective angioplasty. So elective angioplasty in a 30-year-old male who is very stable for uh, so many hours uh, will proceed like an uh, elective procedure for uh, a PDCA. Regular our uh, NPM status and we can prepare the lab and take up for elective angioplasty. In this case, I don't think anything is interesting for uh, an anesthesiologist or uh, uh, for even cardiologist. It is a straightforward <laughs> cakewalk case. Okay, ma? Yes, sir. Uh, Agnihotri, sir, wants to speak something. Sir, could you please unmute yourself? That's interesting, sir. Cakewalk. <laughs> Agnihotri, sir, yeah. Could you please unmute yourself, sir? Yeah, unmuted, no? No, Agnihotri, sir, will need to unmute himself. He, wa he wants to make a comment or want to speak something. In the meantime, uh, we have another question, Dr. Parul. Yes, sir. There's a question that uh, that is for Dr. Veduvelai by Dr. Kanizoi. She says, can you tell something on early repolarization syndrome caused by ST elevation and how to differentiate it from MI? Yeah. Uh, first of all, uh, see, uh, many patients, young patients, athletes, farmers, or hard hardworking manual laborers, they will have a very common pattern in ECG. That is sinus cryogadia with early repolarization. There are uh, many patterns, three types of uh, or patterns of ST, uh, early repolarization syndrome. Here, the ST segment per se will not elevate. The only the J point or the junction of the 
uh, S wave and the starting of the you know the T wave, the junction, which is called the J wave, that will be elevated. But it is not a very strong S signal elevation. And uh, uh, gross or a very severe early repolarization syndrome is uncommon. Usually, the S signal elevation is less than or equal to one mm. And usually, we can see some notch. The J point notching will be there, right? So whenever there is a J point notching. And whenever there is only J point elevation, whereas the ST segment per se will not elevate, then, and the patient is not too symptomatic. Most of them, they come for some atypical chest pain, right? So, and, and you can, and from and the echocardiogram, from the enzyme markers, all those things we can, most of the times we can fairly come to a conclusion that it is not ST elevation in mind. But in some patients, it will be difficult uh, because uh, we may think it is, some, some of the patients are wrongly thrombolyzed, especially uh, the early repolarization in leaves are common in uh, patients and they may present actually with uh, asymptotic disease related symptoms and these patients are sometimes laced outside in the peripheral hospital as inferior volume. So that has, that has to be uh, avoided. Thank you so much, sir. Dr. Agnotri, sir, you wanted to say something, sir? Yes, yes, please. Thanks a lot, uh, dear. It is very nicely illustrated. Both the speakers has done the wonderful job. My question is that one of the cases I have encountered, the right coronary was calcified and the angioplasty was attempted, angiography. They could not pass it. So what is the role of lithopraxy angiography? Uh, yes, sir. Now, uh, calcified coronaries, previously it used to be a nightmare to address these issues. Like uh. 10 years or 5 years, uh, 10 years before, it used to be very difficult. The only yeah. option that was available since last, uh, I will say, two decades was rotablation. There, there will be a diamond-shaped burr will be there. It rotates at a speed of 1,65,000 rotations per minute. So it creates a lot of kinetic energy and, and, it, it, and it shaves up the calcium in the coronary vessels. So that we can place the coronaries expand. And you need to be a little closer to the microphone, sir. Your voice is breaking. I'm sorry to disturb. Okay, okay, okay. So, the only option available uh, that was available before was rotational atherectomy, where a small device uh, with a tapered uh, diamond, a diamond shape. Bar, burring, burring hole. Yeah, burring. Yeah, it's, it's called burring. It rotates yeah. at a very high speed, like 1,65,000 rotations per minute. Because of that, it can shave off the calcium and uh, can debulk the calcified lesion. And yeah. we can expand the lesion by ballooning, then by placing the stent. What about uh, but, the crystals? When uh, after ballooning, the crystals will migrate distally. Again, they will choke it. Ah, uh, yes, sir. Uh, but the crystals, diamond crystals, will not go off. the The maximum allowed time for rotablation is less than five minutes. If somebody ablates the vessel for too long, the diamond chips in the burr can get embolized and can produce slow flow. And one more complication is that the 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 calcified materials, the atheroma itself, can get embolized. The yes. thrombus can get discharged, it can produce slow flow, but in majority of the patients, we can successfully come out, like by giving some drugs and pre-treating the lesion, all those things, we, we can come out. Because now, rotablation equipment and uh, the technology has been, become very, very uh, lighter and very become user-friendly. Now, Rotav Pro has come, where yes. the technology has become very easier. In addition to rotablation, now, uh, what you have advised is intravascular lithotripsy or lithoplasty, where that we part. pass in a balloon and yes. by by like something uh, akin to ESWL for treatment of uh, urinary stones, we yeah, produce a lot of right. ultrasonic vibration, thereby uh, shaken up and loosen up the calcium and can expand the stent properly. There is one what more is your because... experience about this thing? So IVL is a very, very, very easy user-friendly device and it can be used by even a novice cardiologist. For, for using a rotablation, we should have a good learning curve. But for okay. IVL, it's not that difficult. It it's costly. It's costly. I am the patient of the same thing. That's why I'm asking. Yeah, I, <laughs> I could unsuccessful. Get it. it was unsuccessful angiography and I am suffering from CCF now. Due to the only left LED is working, rest of the, all the vessels. I have undergone bypass surgery 20 years back. All, all choked now. So okay. is, if your institution does it, can I attempt it? Sir, I will... Uh, sir, from which place? From Bhopal. Sir, it has been done in almost all the centers. From Bhopal, you, you don't need to come to the, this south. You can, or it, it can be done anywhere. 
but in some of the patients like 5 percent of the patients where the calcium is very severe especially post bypass where the graft itself is calcified it yeah. may be really difficult okay thank you thank you sorry i have that for my personal problem along with the wonderful lecture thank you okay. Okay. Hey, sir we have a question from uh, uh, dr monica chikra she wants to ask you how to manage airway bleed in difficult airway during thrombolysis During, uh, sir, your voice is not clear, sir. If suppose already the patient is thrombolyzed, and yes, now you are, yeah, now you are going to intubate, and you have to take all the precautions. For example, what we follow the protocol is we put the laryngoscope and directly put the buji. We don't try try to attempt with the regular endotracheal tube at all, because it, the endotracheal tube it can even uh, uh, give a small erosion in the mucosa. that can have a bleed and when the size is not appropriate or if the intubation is very difficult you will come across uh, hemorrhage so now our technique is like whenever the patient is thrombolyzed in our emergency or in a cath lab we put the laryngoscope put airway i mean buji over the buji we guide as one size smaller endotracheal tube for example adult we do with eight for example female patients we don't go more than seven size so undersize the tube and with the help of buji do a, a intubation which will avoid a, a bleeding and if suppose there is a bleed immediately give a saline wash and do suctioning and sedate and paralyze the patient for 24 hours let the patient not struggle on ventilator with endotracheal tube so this bleeding will settle once the drug effect wears off then slowly wean off uh, one case what we did is next day we did a bronchoscopy give a was you were given a bronchoscopic wash and remove the remaining clots and once the airway is clear we extubate it after 48 hours this is the routine protocol we follow so sir you want to say that before we do a intubation we should take a smaller tube and use a buji for it and in case if there is a uh, already a bleeding is present then we should put the patient on ventilatory support and paralyze the patient yeah that's that's in a nutshell i think that in answers our question and there's another question by dr chandrapriya uh she says that the question i wanted to ask was that a 30 year old man with 50 heart rate with st elevation and inferior leads asymptomatic for non cardiac surgery should we ask for echo or should we refer the patient to the cardiologist first a 30 year old young patient for non cardiac surgery yes sir uh, with history of mi uh, so with st elevation and uh, inferior leads the patient is asymptomatic and the heart rate is 50 so yeah, definitely we should uh, do echocardiogram please consult your colleague cardiologist and make sure that uh, your cardiac system is stable uh, you know that there is mi with mi if you are going to take up a non cardiac surgery either regional or uh, general anesthesia you are going to face complications on table if suppose if it is a major lad lesion you are going to face arrhythmias or if it is any inferior all mi you are going to face again bradycardia and uh, it can go for a cardiac arrest so without evaluation definitely 100% you should not touch tomorrow it will be a big problem a 30 year old young fellow came to theater patient was all right the patient was talking before going to the operating room i brought my husband in a very good shape something happened in the operating room and you know all these stories can happen so better evaluate and take a high risk concern and do it so dr nishant i don't think i don't see any more questions so what do we uh, do we wind up now yes i think uh, there are no more questions uh, uh, navin sir uh, uh, thank you very much uh, both the speakers and it was a very nice and interactive uh, session bit different than the routine classes where we have a single teacher uh, teaching about a particular subject but today we were en enriched by the knowledge and experience of a cardiologist and a cardiac anesthesiologist Uh, it was really a very nice and interactive session thank you both the speakers it was pleasure to have you with us today evening and i am very sure that you will join us soon uh, for the some more combined classes in very near future thank you very much and uh, see you all next uh, week for a class on supraglottic airway devices by dr ranju singh from delhi thank you very much thank you sir thank you sir thank you thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.